Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is a, a nice attendance here for the uh, Edwina and, and Charles Milner Women in the Arts Lecture Series. We're so glad that you guys uh, continue to support this series. And uh, tonight, uh, we've got it set up. Usually when we're in this building, that means that the, sh uh, the uh, lecture will be followed by an exhibition opening, which is over in the McCray Gallery. So please join us after the lecture to come to the opening at the McCray Gallery. So I want to uh, uh, welcome um, Marietta Patricia Lees uh, to give us a talk today about her wonderful work. And uh, I encourage you to uh, ask questions afterwards. If we don't have time, we'll have time at the gallery opening. Please give a hand of, a round of applause for the audience. Well, I think that I should give you a round of applause because I have been so welcomed this week. It's been a terrific week. And um, not only welcomed by the university community, but also by the town. And um, when my husband and I were having lunch the other day, uh, David went to pay the bill to the cashier, and she asked how our installation was going. And I thought, oh, wow. I mean, the, the tie-in between the community and the university uh, was just incredible. And we have been uh, just feeling uh, very, very welcome. So thank you so much for that. And I just want to give a shout out to the Women in the Art series, obviously because I'm a woman artist, and that's so meaningful to me. But also, um, you know, it gives the opportunity to give voice to women in the arts. And I think that's an important thing for everyone to hear, men and women. So I'm very grateful for that, and I'm very grateful for Edwina and Charles who sponsored this program. That's wonderful. And um, I'm also very delighted to have met your president, the president of the university, uh, Dr. Shepard, because I was so impressed with his um, sensibility of really wanting art in the university, art on the campus, represented for culture and for um, just bringing and tying the community and the university together with the arts. I mean, so impressive. That's so unusual and impressive. So I wanted to give a shout out to him as well. And of course to uh, Faye McCalmet because she has been my liaison for over a year putting this all together and she's in the cultural affairs that really manages the program. And that has been a wonderful um, communication. We've really put this all together through email and discussion, and it's been very comfortable. So let me see. There's Paul Hotfeld that has uh, installed the work and has worked hard to make the exhibit that you will see um, come to life. And so I want to give a shout out to him and, of course, to Michael that you just uh, met because um, he's the chair of expressive arts. And I've never heard that term in any other um, art community, expressive arts. And, of course, art is expressive. So it's so apropos and wonderful. Um, let me see. Before I continue, I have to tell you, okay, that... Because it's women in the arts, I was asked to talk about my career and my life. And one, I have a very long life. And two, I've had a very long career. So I had to figure out how to distill that information and yet present it to you. So um, I'm going to keep talking and I'm hoping to edit. And you can ask me questions afterwards. I'll be in the gallery. Um, but. Um, I, I hope it's coherent. I really am making an attempt to cover a lot of ground and try to tell you as much information as I can, but there's a lot. So um, we'll start very soon. But first let me introduce you to my tribe that I brought with me because I would like you to be able to speak to them and 
uh, learn about them since we're cross-referencing here. So first of all, there's my husband, David Vogel, um, and David's had my back for many years now, and as David will tell you, he'll go anywhere I go. So I've always had a companion on my travels and my trips, and um, I'm very appreciative of David. I have had my assistant here all week, Stefan Batista. Yay, Stefan. And um, he's helped with the installation, and he's a wonderful photographer, and he also teaches at Central New Mexico Community College in Albuquerque. So have a word with him. Um, I also have my home gallery, what I call my home gallery, because even though I show it other places, they are my home, and it's uh, the gallery is um, uh, Michael Warren Contemporary in Denver, and they came down from Denver to be with us. So we have Mike McClone and uh, Warren Campbell. So give them a holler too. Okay, I have only two hands, so sometimes I have to put the mic down and take a drink of water. And then come back to you. So what you see up here is just your presentation to the show that will be in the gallery. And the show is called Ingrained Ode to Trees. And when I spoke to students this morning in the gallery, I asked how many of them were tree huggers, because I'm a tree hugger. And many, many hands came up. So let me see from this audience who considers himself a tree hugger. There we go. So we love our trees. And we have trees that have a history with us that we maybe have even measured our height against as we were growing up or that uh, delineated the tree in front of the school, or the one in front of our window, or the one that, in this case, um, the spruce tree that I had to cut down in front of my house. But we also understand that our trees give us our clean oxygen, the air that we breathe, they give us shade and shelter, and they're an important vital part of our everyday life and they're also in peril. So, you know, part of this exhibit that you will be seeing, and I'll be over there so I can talk to you about the various things that are over there, but um, part of the story is about loving trees and wanting to protect them. So that's uh, what we'll be discussing over there. But right now, let me talk about, here it comes, the long life I've led. Okay. So, um, this is not an unfamiliar scenery, but you know, when I give lectures out of the country or anything, I always have to show them where I live because one, they don't, they're not sure that New Mexico is in the United States. And, you know, I always have to kind of familiarize them. And uh, this is, of course, the Sandia Mountains and the grasses, and that's the locale where I live and work. I live and work in Albuquerque. And this is my studio. And it's the first studio that I built from scratch. And I've been an artist for 50 years now, plus, plus. And um, I've had studios in many storefronts, in many garages, in many extra bedrooms, in sometimes a living room, many times on a kitchen table and uh, always wanted my own studio, and finally got to build it. And it's the first studio I've had with windows, because I decided that this studio, I was probably gonna grow very old in, and I wanted it to be a psychological space, some place where one day I'll be able to sit and look out the window and dream, and maybe envision um, a painting, rather than maybe having to physically make it. So it's a very beautiful space and I like it. And over there, you see two sculptures. Oh, I know I have a, a thing. It always reminds me in the movies of when they're gonna target someone though, so it's kind of scary. <laughs> so let me see. Okay, that, there it is. 
Okay, so there's two sculptures, and these are called then and, Now and Then, and uh, they're wood sculptures. And when I was putting this slide together, I thought, oh my goodness, see how long I've been working with wood. So there is a history of uh, being familiar with wood and working with wood. And there they are. And this is me in the studio. So you can see, I have windows. Okay, so let's see where we go next. I'm on an octopus tonight. Okay, so let me tell you, people ask me my influences, and most of my influences actually are from life, not from uh, necessarily art. Um, a lot of my influence comes from traveling. I like, I've traveled extensively. I've done 13 artist residencies around the world. I choose kind of obscure places to go. I go where my heart wants me to go. And um, when my husband, when I said my husband said he'll follow me anywhere, he's followed me to some very strange places and I'll be showing you some of those tonight. But um, one of my great influences is my grandmother. So this is my grandmother, Napoliello. Um, she's from Italy and she's from, she was, and she's from a town called Tiora, where I have visited and where I have been. And it's south of Naples in the chain of mountains that always has earthquakes. So, but my grandmother was such a sensuous person. She was a great cook. She had a beautiful garden that had flowers and she let me always tag along. So I could go out into the garden with her, help her pick flowers. She'd talk to me about them. She'd arrange them with color. In the kitchen, she was very creative, always cooking. And when I smell garlic and olive oil, you know, it's a very sensual uh, memory for me. You know, I just think of grandma. But she was such a great influence in my life. And so, and she had this old world home. Um, and they were not wealthy people at all, but they really appreciated uh, original art and sculpture and furnishings. And so I had a taste of that from her every time I walked into the house. So she's incredibly important. And this is a, a painting of mine that's in the museum in Tiora. And that's the mayor. And when I go to Tiora, he embraces me, we have to take photographs, and I am the famous artist who originated from Tiora. So there you are. I'm a star there. That's awesome. And then there is my mother, who was trained as a commercial artist. She went to Art Students League in New York City. She stopped being a commercial artist when she married, but she was always creative. This is some of her early work, and I still have other pieces of hers, but I just love what she did. You know, it was the era, and it was very beautiful. But I also like the way she created in our home. And it was, you know, sewing clothes or doing the upholstery or, or arranging flowers. So that creativity was certainly something. Uh, and she still drew. She made uh, the newsletters for the PTA and her drawings and everything. And so that was very much a part of my life growing up. So I always drew, I always painted because mom did. But for some reason, um, and uh, I got enamored by Let's see, dance. I saw a movie when I was very young. I think it was called Unfinished Dance with Margaret O'Brien. Some of you can't relate to this at all, I know. But I saw it and I just loved the dancing. So starting at the age 70, I trained as a ballet dancer. And when I think about it, I think about how that has shaped my life because I learned discipline at a very young age. I was studying every day 
And when you were studying, and I don't know how many of you have studied dance, but you really uh, went to the bar every day and tried to do better. Not with everyone else, but with yourself. You tried that the turnout was better or that the plie was better. And so you always were striving. And that's something that I bring into my studio practice today. So discipline and striving were two of the things that I brought with me from my dance. And I continued dancing. I was professionally dancing actually through high school. And one summer, I think I was 14 or 15, and oh, I was a New Jersey girl. I didn't tell you that. I was a New Jersey girl, moved to New York when I was 17, moved to Los Angeles in my 20s, and moved to New Mexico in my 30s. But um, one summer, I was in summer stock, and they were having, it was repertory, so we had dancers, we had actors, blah, 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 blah. And um, the director was doing a show, uh, a drama, and it was about gangsters and gun, gun malls. I had a New Jersey accent back then. So imagine that. Who would they choose and ask to be a gun mall? They asked me. And so I said, yes, I would do it. And I was a dancer in that, uh, for that summer, but I said I would do this role. And what I found working with the actors and directors was we studied the, um, intentions of the role. We studied um, the life of the characters. And I just felt this whole expansion, you know, it was different than darning my toe shoes. And uh, it just expanded me. And I thought, this is pretty cool. So, you know, I started to then have both careers. And when I did go to New York at the age of 17, I did both. I did acting and dancing. And uh, you know, um, found that both expanded me, but especially the research that I did along the way with the acting. And that has stayed with me. With all my work uh, in the visual arts, I do a great deal of research. You know, sometimes I meet some people and I talk about my work and they say, oh my gosh, you really think about your work. And I go, yes, you know, because the concept might be that you just go in and you paint or you do physical work. But all of us artists are thinking about our work. And sometimes it's information that we've accumulated, but a lot of times it's that we have to really go and do some research. So that's the beginning. And then, let me just quickly, there's been, whoa, I skipped one. There's been uh, such an evolution in my work, but um, it's not like I found something in my 20s and continued to do it. But this goes back several decades, and uh, you can see the complexity. And when you go over and see my work today, you'll see that it has changed, and we'll go through that evolution. But part of the complexity was my life was complex. And for some of you, you know that your art reflects your life. And back here, I was a single mom. I had two children. I had outside day jobs that I had to have. And so what I learned to do, and it's abstract, but it's every little section is filled. But I could do that and then let that go and come back the next day and do that and then let that go. So it was fractured like my life. And I pieced it together as a collage. So that went on for a long time. And then it kind of started to get some open spaces, but still there's a lot of complexity. And a lot of reference to that old European house that I knew when I was a young girl. Now I'm throwing this one in, maybe, there we go. Um, yes. 
I'm throwing this one in because it's part of a series from my Marietta Robusti Ticturetto series. And um, I read an anthology many years ago. This ties into women in the arts. So I, I read an anthology many years ago, and it was um, a tiny little section about Marietta Robusti Tintoretto, the daughter of Tintoretto, the master painter from Venice. And one, of course, her name jumped out at me. My mother's name was Marietta. I'm Marietta, Marietta Tintoretto. Oh, and my heritage is Italian. Oh, so that stuck with me for a while. And at uh, one time, I wrote um, an application for a grant and got money. So I got money for three years to do the research. And again, back then, you know, we didn't have Google. And so the money included me having to go to Venice. And uh, I know, it's a shame, it's a shame. And I had to go to the libraries there and find out more about her, go to her neighborhood. Her workshop is still there, her dad's workshop. And she became head of that workshop when she was 14 years old. And he trained her uh, and to take her out in the street and show her art and everything, she had a dress as a boy. And she became an a, a, a incredible painter and did um, had her fame in her own time. And all her work kind of got subsumed to her father and her brother Domenico. And so you can rarely find a piece, but every once in a while, they clean a painting and they find this little <laughs> M in the corner, and that's Marietta. And so what I did was all this research, the research now is at Seton Hall University in New Jersey, and the paintings are mostly at the Museo Italo-Americana in San Francisco. But it was a wonderful group of work to do. And I got to lecture as it toured, it toured for three years, and talk about um, a woman artist. So that was a wonderful thing. And that's one piece of the work. And, okay, so I put these in because um, uh, I'm a multimedia artist. And I talked about this this morning, and one of the reasons that I'm trying to think. I think it's my curiosity that I've always been interested in, how can I express this? How can I show you this? How can I um, express the intention of the work? And uh, so was, there was a time when I wanted to create a neighborhood and show the different personalities in the neighborhood. And I did a whole group of constructions that were windows and doors. And each one looked just a little bit different. They all had their personality. And you know, even in your town, when you go around, you see the wreath on the door or how people have their potted flowers on their porch. Each thing is a little bit different. And it's the personality. So I created this whole town. And it was installed in different places in galleries and in public spaces, and it was doors. But I picked out these two from a long time ago because they're wood. And I started thinking, yeah, there's been this wood theme for a long time. So that's from my construction days. Okay. So then I took, well, it, it didn't happen overnight. Nothing ever does. So I was studying Tibetan Buddhism and learning how to meditate and calm down after that fractured, hectic life. And um, uh, it, was, it was very pleasant. And then I took a trip to Japan and went to Zen gardens and became interested in Zen Buddhism, which to me suited a place where I needed to go because it really um, uh, minimalized things, it simplified things, it made things feel um, calmer, even more so than another type of meditation. I love the Zen gardens. I love the austerity of the monks' robes. Um, so that was an, an era. Now this particular pic a picture is from touring Japan and meeting a lot of 
um, artisans and artists that um, were considered national treasures and living national treasures. And that really appealed to me too. I thought, oh, that's so cool that you know these elders are uh, considered and esteemed so highly. So this is a mask maker, and there he is sitting down making his masks, and he's a living treasure in Japan. So all these things were coming together with me, and um, no, yes. So um, this work. Oh wait, there's wait, wait, wait. Go back, go back. There we go. Okay. Um, so this group of work came out of that transitional phase, and this group of work was called the Shards, and it was when I start, my work started emptying out, and I started to really think about the space in between forms, and um, it was the breathing part, the air, um, and the spaces, uh, ground, background, uh, meant more to me than the forms. But I was very interested when I first began this series of work, and it went on for a couple years, but I was very interested in things that I was already teaching art students, which was that there are no confined shapes, that we are not static, that we have molecules that are dancing with the air around us all the time, that we're interacting all the time with what our situation is, what our environment is. And that really was of interest to me. So it was how can I make the forms interact with the space? And where do they envelop each other? And that was what this work was about. Oh, I should mention color. Yes, well, let's go on, and color will definitely come, and I'll have to, here, here we are. Okay, so then uh, I had an artist residency in Crater Lake, Oregon. Are any of you familiar with that, Crater Lake? Okay, it's the deepest, bluest lake that we have in the United States. Maybe North America, I'm not sure. But uh, they were having their tricentennial, and. Uh, they had a group of artists that went up and painted, and then the work was shown as that tricentennial in the museum uh, there. But uh, So I had a, a place to stay where I woke up to this deepest, bluest lake every single day. And I felt almost like, it's a crater lake, right? Like a crater. And I felt like I could like disappear, like I could fall into this and be immersed in it. And that was extremely um, appealing to me. Because uh, long ago, I had had the experience of going through the Vietnam Memorial. And uh, for those of you that have been there, and I'm sure quite a few of you, but you know how you walk down into it and you feel you become part of the experience? Well, that's the way I felt with Crater Lake, too, is that I could drop into it and it would envelop me or immerse me. And I thought to myself, I really want people to experience that in my work. I want them to feel that they can become a part of that. And this is when color started, monochromatic color started meaning a great deal to me. And of course you can see that from the shards to here, there's a progression, but the color what it's come to mean to me is that it is emblematic of an environment, a place, a memory. Uh, it evokes emotion in people because of the temperament. You react different to red than to blue. But also, people can look at a color and say, oh, that reminds me of, and if it's green, it's you grew up in Vermont, if it's brown, you grew up in New Mexico. You know, there's just an encompassing feeling about color. And I felt, you know, I don't need to say much more. You know, a color can do a lot. So that's when color became very much a part of this work. And uh, so from Crater Lake, 
And you can see I am trying to be coherent with you, but also trying to show you a lot. So then blue. Okay, so I stayed with blue and still do blue paintings. I love blue. Um, air and sea and water, and especially water because we have drought. Um, but um, one of the things that happened, okay, I have to go back to show you this. You see these paintings, the shards, I mean the, the blue paintings, they have edges. And when I looked at the, the crater lake, I thought there's sunset setting on the edge or there's turquoise water as it gets toward the edge. And I felt very safe with edges. They kind of held me. I didn't feel I was gonna fall off. It was a very emotional feeling. It was safety to me to have edges. And then one day I said, you know, the color is really the meaningful thing to me. How would it feel to me if I didn't have edges? And it was terrifying. I mean, that sounds silly, but it was like, oh my gosh, if I get rid of the edges, do I have a painting? Will I feel be ripped, you know, that I don't have those edges to make me safe, to confine me. And so one day I just said a dare, you know, and as an artist, you always have to dare you. You know, you always have to take that leap into the unknown, because if you don't, you're just staying with the known. And then what do you learn or what does your audience learn? So if you're scared of something, go toward, go find out what that is. And one day I, was in the studio, made a painting, and just let myself fall off the edge and was very comfortable with that. I thought, oh my gosh, I didn't drop. It really felt like I just glided along. And you know, a lot of my paintings today don't have edges except for the confound of the format that the painting is on. And these paintings, um, some of them that I do have receding formats, so they recede to the wall and float in front of the wall. And I try to that have you experience that painting or that color rather than to see that it's, it's attached to the wall. It comes toward you. I'm going in and out, I know. Okay. So, um, Let's talk about this, intentions. Um, I always set intentions, and it's not like for this painting, it's for what is my overall intention now of how I want to go about making my work. And so I care very much about the environment. I want to make statements about our environment. I want to save our trees. I want our trees to be it depicts it so beautifully that it arouses in you a feeling of like, oh my God, I love our trees. You know, if they're in peril, I want to make sure they're okay. Um, so that's part of the blue. I want our water to stay pure. You know, I want it to be clean. Um, so hopefully, because those are passions for me, uh, they impact my work and it's part of my intention. So the environment. Also a sense of place. I travel a lot and when I do residencies I try to live in a place where I can at least experience superficially some of the life in that place. But what I find, and all of you have had this experience in some way, is that you learn a lot from traveling. You learn a lot about people. You learn about the environment. You learn that we're not so different, that there really aren't borders and walls, that we really are a, a universal humanity, and um, that there are different environmental features. So I think, you know, that's definitely one of the things I want to convey in my work. And I'm very pleased when I'm in Finland, I was there in the Arctic Circle doing a residency, and painted the translucent northern skies that they had that changed colors all the time and then had an exhibit there and people would walk in and say oh that's the color of our sky and it changes to that color and it does that
but they were relating to it. But then I bring it to the United States and show it and have the origins and people relate to it here and they say, oh, that's in Finland too. And so that's part of that sense of place. Uh, color of place, we've already talked about, because I think color can depict place. Um, sustainability is part of that environmental com compassion that I have for our planet and wanting it to survive. Um, I talk about quiet places because, and I'll discuss this later as well, because I think we all need quiet places. We need quiet. So I, I seek out quiet places. And my paintings are quiet. I don't think my paintings will shout at you. Um, you know, so I try just to calm people down, including myself when I'm painting them. You know, it's just like, whoosh. You know, just calm down. Um, and thin places, as uh, written about, and thin places are uh, described as and I believe we can relate to this in New Mexico, is where heaven and earth kind of come together. That place right there where, you know, maybe the molecules pass through. And so, you know, thin places, spiritual places mean a lot to me. And um, restraint, because you see my early paintings, I put everything in them. You know, and now I save things for the next painting. And one of the things that helped me was reading Jane Austen and becoming such a fan because her characters didn't just babble. They didn't tell you everything. They held back and said, they parsed out their words. They let you know what they wanted, but they didn't say everything. You had to like uncover it. And so that's what I try to do in my work as well. And the essence, you know, how can I whittle things down and show you the bare essence and talk to you about that? So, uh, oops, I, I'm click, clicker happy. Um, okay, let's talk about residencies because, you know, we talk about an artist's life and, um, and I'll discuss it a little bit later, too. Uh, but an artist's life, uh, you say, well, what can you do? You cobble together a life, and you try to figure out, if you have the passion to be an artist, how to maintain being an artist for the rest of your life. And one of the things that I have found really is an advantage of being an artist is that you can do artist residencies all over the world. And one of the ways I do them is I know where I want to go. I know what I want to experience. And I start, now that we have the internet, Googling and finding what's available. And sometimes it's, an, it's a place that's never had an artist in residence. And so one day I was looking through a fashion magazine and saw a fashion layout that was done in the Highlands in Scotland. And I loved the scenery. And so I got in touch with this uh, estate. It's uh, the Cotter Estate up in the Highlands. And um, they had lodges that they rented on the estate that's part of the income. It's one of the largest estates. I think the largest estate in Scotland now. But they had lodges there. And I spoke to Lady Cotter. Um, and she was, luckily, a fan of contemporary art. She looked at my website and she said, well, I can let you have the Fisherman's Cottage in November. And I said, I'm coming. And it was right uh, at the Finhorn River there. There's the cottage. And we were there for a month in November and experienced the highlands. And out of that came a group of work that was about the light in that valley and how it changed and the subtlety of it. Whenever I'm in the far north, you know, that translucent light is really appealing to me. So, uh, you know, work does come from these residencies. I am working. But just in contrast, uh, I've been painting blue for a long time, and 
I decided I needed to feel the earth. So I decided I want to go someplace very green. I looked around and I found a residency in northern Thailand. And um, it was the only private residency, not state run. And my studio was outdoors in this lush, plush, green garden. And some of the green paintings that you're going to see in the gallery are from that experience. And does that show up well? Because that's the house. And so it was very, very lovely and a totally different experience. And um, a small town, and we were able to shop and talk to people. And we taught at one of the schools, the grammar schools, and had a wonderful experience there. And out of that experience came a group of green paintings that toured for three years. And it was called Scarcity and Abundance, Green Scarcity and Abundance. And it had videos and paintings and sculptures and various things, components of it. But what, it, uh, what I thought about was the abundance of green and growth and rice and food and, and uh, entrepreneurship in Thailand. And then we went to Cambodia and Laos and those people were suffering. And so I thought, as we all do sometimes, is that the earth gives us so much, you know, why can't we just share and take care of everyone? So that toured for three years. Okay, so then what happens? Okay, thank you, David, for going everywhere I go. Because one, one year, not too long ago, four or five years ago, I decided I really had to have a bipolar year. And um, so we went on an excursion to the Antarctic. And we did that in their summer. So even though it was cold, we did get, uh, it was comfortable. We had to wear lots and lots of layers. We were on a Russian excursion ship. Um, there were all kinds of environmental uh, rules and everything, but um, it, it was incredible. And if any of you have the opportunity, I'd say jump on the ship and go, because it's a primal world. It's an untouched world. Uh, the rules are very regulated as to where you can step, where you can go. Um, you know, they don't want contamination, but it's very inspiring. And it is, um, you just never see it. It is primordial. And so one of the reasons I wanted this bipolar year was because we're hearing about what's happening about global warming, warming and, you know, the shattering of the glaciers and the icebergs and everything, and I wanted to see, I wanted to see it before too much damage is done, and I wanted to understand in a more uh, uh, introspective way, just understand what's happening, visually understand it, not just read about it. So uh, we went, and um, it was, I mean, uh, get yourself in good shape to go because it was strenuous, but uh, absolutely incredible. And out of that came, whoa, whoa, there I get trigger happy. Oh, back and forth, what am I showing you? There we go. Out of that came a lot of work, including these uh, shattering uh, glaciers that um, uh, I've, I've put them in various um, uh, installations and they can go horizontally, they can drip, they can fall, they can be on the ground. And so they were part of the work that came out of that experience. Okay, where do you think we are now? I said bipolar, right? Well, Green. I have been in the Arctic Circle before, but um, this, and, and oh, when I was in the Ar Arctic Circle doing an artist residency in Finland, I asked uh, people, what it was like to be in Finland in the Arctic Circle in the winter, because when we were there in the summer, it was light all the time. Um, and um, I wondered what it's like to be dark all the time. And they said to me, well, it's, it's, it's fine. Uh, it's like 
the light part is on the ground and the dark part is in the sky. It's like the world turns upside down. Well, I heard that and I thought, wait, the world turns upside down? I've got to go. So um, uh, the other thing that they said, that there was a certain hour of the day when there was just enough light that it kind of, the whole world became monochromatically like a navy blue. So um, I searched and I found a, a residency that stays open in the winter in Iceland. So it was in the southern part of Iceland, not quite in the Arctic Circle, but it was gonna be dark all the time. And darkness has a particular interest for me. One, because I was a Brady cat when I was young. And I think a lot of us, those are holdovers where you know darkness is sort of uncomfortable or uneasy. But I had been hearing about the dark matter in the sky, you know, we look up, having more information than the stars that we can see, and that they're actually building robots that can look and investigate the dark matter and translate it back to us because we can't see it. And so I thought that's pretty fascinating. So um, off to Iceland we went, and from uh, that kind of environment came a group of work that I just skipped, but there it is. Um, and I used a lot of burnished graphite to talk about the uh, volcanic landscape of Iceland. And um, let's see if I can get you past that. And um, this uh, is talking about the work that you're going to see in the gallery. So we'll just go over there and talk about that. You can ask me any questions. I'll be glad to talk to you individually, as a group, whatever. And hmm. so these are what you're going to see over there. Control. I'm falling off the edge. Bear with me just a little bit here. Uh oh. Wait. I got it. Woo. Okay. Um, electronics of me, isn't it fun? Uh, you should hear me at my computer. Okay. So this is an artist's life. And um, uh, how do you sustain a long career? How do you keep going? Let's talk about that. And maybe some of the questions that you might want to ask, if you have them, might be about this. Um, I'm, you know, in a group of artists that uh, has been around a long time, and we do discuss how have we, how have we done this? You know, how did we get here? How did we sustain this career? One is sense of purpose or uh, passion. You know, uh, and it starts very young. You want to express it. You saw dancing, acting. It was all expression. It was all wanting to tell you something, wanting to communicate, wanting to feel something, wanting to put it down, wanting to communicate. Um, then I talk about planning a healthy life, and we all work at balance, I know. But um, it's a hard life, it's a physical life. So, you know, I encourage young people, all those things your mom told you, eat right, exercise, you know, keep yourself healthy to sustain uh, the life that you need, which is sometimes three jobs to keep going. Um, so there we go. Frug uh, frugality, and I talk about that being frugal. You know, my good years when I have work that's popping out the door, you know, what I do, one, is I make sure I buy all the supplies I need to have for the next few years, but also to save that money 
and because you have to dole it out in other years. And you know, right now, with uh, we're all talking about Marie Kondo and her simplicity and cleaning out and everything, but you know, just live frugally. Um, perseverance, biting the bullet and keep going, pull up your socks. Um, stretching, making your life interesting, trying something new, go on residencies, be a visiting teacher, you know, just keep making it work. Um, curiosity, learning, we all have that need and certainly an artist does. Trusting, I talk about a spiritual practice and that can mean many, many things. But sometimes when I talk to people, I say, what is your core? What is the thing that makes you stand where you are? What, what do you dig down deep to hold you? And that could be many, many things. But you know, you all have to have it. As an artist, you have to have it. So that's another thing. Um, uh, relationships, forming them. I talk about that a lot with young artists. Start now, get to your curator that likes your work. Uh, the critic that likes your work, um, the, ga the gallery director, the museum director, and those people come and go through your life, but a lot of them you keep for a lifetime, and that's important, those relationships. Um, you know, one of the things I think about in my own practice is honesty, and I think that in the studio I can't fool myself. You know, when I make a bad piece of art, I know it sucks. You know, and I try to convince myself because I have a deadline, and then I go, no, I can't really show this. You know, and so it does keep you honest. That's part of my life. And um, I talk a lot about organization, and my assistant, Stefan, can tell you I am hyper-organized. And you have to be, because there's a lot of things going, and you have to organize it in a way that you can control some of your life. And the other thing is just the studio practice that you develop. And I do call it a studio practice. It's like meditation practice or any other kind of practice. It's like how do you uh, develop your practice? And some artists tell you they work um, eight to five every day. I'm not like that. I have had periods in my life when I've been like that. But the way I work now is I do a lot of work you know, for maybe a few months. And then I pull back and I do the business of art or whatever I need to do. And then psh, I go again. So, you know, we all develop the practice that works for us. So those are some of the things and we can talk about that some more. And what have I just done now? Oh, these are just questions I want you to ask yourself if you care to. And they are, uh, what is success for you? Because that also helps you to think about your career or your life. And is it is success to you honing your craft, really getting to a point where you say, oh my God, I can do this. I'm confident that I can do this. Is it um, recognition? Do you want to be a star? Do you want people to recognize you? Do they want, do you want fame and fortune? Those are hard to things to attain. So you might want to scale down a little bit. Um, so yeah, so uh, bliss, you know, do you want your, I still feel blissful about the work that I do. All these years, I feel blissful. And I think that that's something that makes me continue to be an artist. And that's success. Hey, if I have a blissful life, that's success. Uh, exhibiting in venues or whatever. And you know, you can look at that many different ways. And one of the ways that I do it is I want to communicate. So I want the work to be out and I want it to exhibit. And if I exhibit here, that's wonderful. If I exhibit, you know, in the Metropolitan Museum, that's good too. But you know, it is the communication part that's important to me. Um, being connected and networked in a community that could certainly be success, feeling that you're part of that social structure. So I think it's just good to say, wait, I need to define a personal success for myself. 
what does that mean? Because it's often, you know, uh, I go into a situation and someone will say, well, what are your paintings sell for? And that's like reading The Little Prince, right? It's like, what is that about? That's not what I think about my career. I, I'll, uh, I do sell my paintings and they do cost money, but that's not the success of being an artist for me. So you have to think, what is the success for you and how do you want to attain it? Okay, we're wrapping up. Uh, here's the future. Um, the piece of work that you see is called The Silent Road, and that's going to be shown at the Venice Biennale this year. And it is a 60-foot piece of burnished graphite that's draped and will hang from a ceiling two stories. And so that's coming up. It will be there May to November if you're in Venice. And, um, well, that would be good. And whoops. Okay. And this is, um, I'm just looking, cause is there a white? Oh, it's only on the, on the monitor. It's not up there. So these are uh, photographs that will be shown at the Mark Rothko Art Center in Latvia, in the town where he was born. And I have a solo show there that's called Air, which we've been talking about somewhat tonight, which is the air that we all share. So um, that exhibit is coming up. And this is my book of poetry that's available to you. And if you'd like to copy, I'm signing them tonight. And um, it's a poetry, oh, I know I'm really taking a long time, but I told you it was a long time, so hang in with me. Um, it's uh, reflections in poetry and uh, art. So it's a, it's a week that I had without any electronics um, in doing an artist residency in Northern California. And as I was telling someone last night, it, without electronics, I noticed every little tiny thing. And so, you know, when a fish jumped out of the pond, it became a poem because that's the way my mind started working. And, you know, I wrote the book in hopes that other people would take a pause. But there is one poem in here that I would like to read to you because it's emblematic of the exhibit that you're going to go see. I hope, I hope some of you will go over there. So it's called Tree, and uh, the poem says, O oh, majestic tree, how safe I feel hugging your stable trunk. Although you tower over me, you protect my soul from unbelieving. And so when we talk about our spiritual core, there you go. So um, let's see, I think we're almost wrapped up. Yes, there we go, the end. And that you will see across the way as well. So um, maybe we can turn on the lights and see if anyone has questions. I tried to get through my life as best I could, people. You've been very, very patient. I appreciate it. Okay. Questions? Answers? Are, are some of you going to go over with us? Yes? Good, good, good. Okay, so if you have questions over there, or need discussion, or anything, we will definitely, definitely be there. So... There's one question here, Mary. Yeah. Yes? If you want to do questions over there, I, my question is, I like the quotation you said about, I have to leave something for the next painting. That resonated with me. How do you know when to stop? Oh, you know, that is the most talked about thing in, for artists. Um, it's discussed so much, and probably other people have other ideas. Uh, but um, it takes so much practice. And I think one of the things that started helping me was that uh, I always thought I could make the work better if I just did a little more. And so it was very hard to just say, this is good enough. 
this is really good. This says what I want it to say. And I'll say what, you know, the other things I wanted to say for another painting. But the other thing that helped me was I got a, um, oh, the camera that has instant um, film. Polaroid. Polaroid, thank you very much. Okay, so I got a Polaroid camera and I would take a picture of the piece that I was working on and I'd just go around for a day with that picture. And I finally said, you know, that's good or no, it does really need something else. But I would take pictures of different stages. And what was awful was when I started realizing that it really was good enough and I ruined it going further, you know. And then I said, oh, I've really got to learn how to do this. But it's one of the most talked about things. It's like, when do you know when to stop? And um, I think I finally have it, but once in a while, I still regress. So good luck. <laughs> Find a way. Yes? I was just curious. Um, the Marietta, the Venetian woman, when did she live? In Venice. And when? Oh, in the 1500s. 1530, 1560. Yeah, yeah, early. Yeah. OK. I think I probably talk too much because you have nothing to ask me. You're either exhausted or, <laughs> yes. In your uh, kind of artistic path, starting in New Jersey and moving forward in New Mexico, which I find fascinating, you have that transition, um, and living in these quiet, thin places, how much of your life has been changed, it sounds like, by kind of getting into, correct me if I'm wrong, this kind of Buddhist attitude of, of centering and of being observant and, and absorbing. Yeah. Well, it's a work in progress, as all our lives are. And I think when I mentioned that, you know, we continually are trying to rebalance our lives, you know, it has to do with that. But I can tell you, it set up a desire to be more quiet. And it set up a desire to have reflective moments in my days. And my life is very busy. And, you know, there's a lot of work coming in, going out, a lot of business being done. But on very good days, and sometimes weeks, you know, I do take quiet moments. And I do pause. The book's title's Pausing. And I do pause and quiet myself. So it really has influenced me a lot. Um, you know, I'm not the frenetic person that I was, but, you know, I really have to pay attention. And I know, for instance, it's been very busy because I'm trying to figure out the best way to ship this piece to Venice, and there's been so much investigation. But we're staying up at the lodge, the Bear Mountain Lodge, and it's been a really good opportunity to revisit being quiet. And I have spent time just breathing and being in that nature and quieting myself. So it's, it's a practice. But what I have found from the Zen Buddhism is the practicality of not just taking meditation times, like you know, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening, but to have five minutes of meditation throughout the days. And um, that's been really important to make it a practical practice than to devote certain times to it. But it's ongoing, I'm still trying, yeah. Okay, so I don't wanna keep you from going to the gallery, so let's uh, migrate and go over there. And thanks again, you've been very patient, I appreciate it.